Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled Instructional Design, Career Pathways and Trends in a Thriving Industry. This session is being recorded and the archive will be posted to our on-demand recordings page. If you did register through our free events website, you will automatically receive a link to the recording in a few days. Um, so keep an eye out in your inbox for that as well. My name is Lisa Huang and I'm a program manager here at UCI Division of Continuing Education. Here's a brief outline of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about our e-learning instructional design certificate program, which is a fully online program. I'll cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our summer quarter, which begins June 20th. I'll then turn it over to our guest panel, Christy Infantine, Christy Tucker, and Valerie Quezada. During the presentation today, we will have an open Q&A process. Um, and then at the end, I will leave you with my contact information so that you can send over any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to John from Zoom support, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for our panelists regarding the content of this presentation, um, please feel free to submit them at any time in the chat panel, and be sure to send your questions to everyone. So if you see a drop down, you'll want to go ahead and select everyone, and that'll ensure that all of us can see each other's questions and comments. Um, so I want to go ahead and take a couple minutes just to warm up the chat panel. Um, hopefully we can get a good dialogue going on over there. I know Val and Christy, um, they love hearing from all of you and they want to make this as engaging and interactive as possible. So um, go ahead, all the attendees who are joining us right now in the live session, go over to the chat panel and please introduce yourself. Uh, maybe give us your title, organization or company, what industry you're in, and then maybe where you're logging in from today. Let's see. Uh, how many states or maybe even countries we can hit. Great. I see everybody. I see some responses already coming in. And again, just make sure to drop down and select everyone. So I see somebody um, sent one to host and panelists. But if you want everybody to be able to, to see your, your comment or contribution in the chat panel, then go ahead and submit everyone. Great. I'm gonna go ahead and move on, but please continue to introduce yourself in that chat area. And that is gonna be the area that we'll be utilizing throughout this webinar today. Here's a brief overview of the e-learning instructional design certificate program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to develop and deliver training online. Taught by industry experts, the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of e-learning, including the design and development of interactive lessons, project management, evaluation and assessment and more. As a student in the program, you will get hands-on experience with our learning management system, take part in online learning community forums, receive individualized feedback from instructors, and have the opportunity to network and learn from others in the field. Our program is designed for a number of audiences, um, individuals who are completely new to e-learning instructional design, training managers and coordinators, HR professionals, and individuals who have taken on a training role within their department. With the strategic switch uh, to remote and online delivery, companies have prioritized e-learning as they recognize the value of training online. In order to be successful in our certificate program, students should be comfortable navigating software applications and learning management systems. The certificate program is composed of six required courses, which add up to 15 units total. To be eligible for the certificate, students must complete all six courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy and request for certificate form. Now, since there is a small uh, certificate uh, candidacy fee, I'm sorry, I would advise students to take a few courses in our program first before they declare, just to make sure they want to complete the full certificate program. As I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of six online courses. The required courses are listed on this slide. Principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools. Students can choose between either the intro or the beyond basics version of designing and developing interactive e-learning courses. 
project management for e-learning professionals, e-learning evaluation and assessment, and the uh, practicum course at the end. Each course is 2.5 units and will run for eight weeks online. We highly recommend that students start off with the principals class and follow the sequence of courses as shown on this slide. The curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next, so taking courses in this sequence is beneficial. And please note there is a prerequisite for the practicum. You must uh, successfully complete all of the other required courses before enrolling in the practicum. And then at the bottom of the slide, I have also listed a supplemental course that may be of interest to you. Creating your online e-learning portfolio is not part of the certificate program requirements, but it is a wonderful opportunity uh, to help you advance in your career or become better situated in your job search. Our program offers an alternative digital credential or ADC within two courses in our certificate program. Students will have the opportunity to earn an ADC through successful completion of a qualifying assignment within either of the designing and developing interactive e-learning courses uh, within the program. Also referred to as a digital badge, an ADC is a virtual record of the specific skills and competencies acquired and provides a verifiable way to share your educational achievement with others through channels like Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Badges help demonstrate your commitment to professional development and help you stand out in a competitive job market. I've included um, links on this slide if you're interested in learning more about ADCs in general, um, including this specific one in interactive e-learning storyboarding. And I've also included the actual badge image um, on the left here on the slide. In the upcoming summer 2022 quarter, we are offering principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools, project management for e-learning professionals, and the practicum course. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $680. Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our student services office at the number provided. And we do encourage students to enroll early since classes in this program tend to fill up quickly. Each required course in our program costs $680, so you're looking at a total of $4,080 in course fees for the six online courses. Now, you don't pay the entire total upfront. You would simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. There is also a $125 candidacy fee for the program, so in the end, you're looking at just about $4,205 for the entire certificate program. Now, please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page, so you'll know if course materials are required before you enroll in a class. And prior to enrollment in the practicum, students must purchase or otherwise have access to um, and gain working knowledge of an authoring tool, such as Articulate 360, Adobe Captivate, or other. So therefore, software may be an additional expense. And I'd like to point out um, information about a special discount we offer for the program. We offer 10% off course fees to members of ATD San Diego, Orange County, and Los Angeles chapters. So if you are a member of any of these chapters, please visit the chapter website for more information about the discount. Here's a screenshot of our online course schedule, which always has the most up-to-date information. You can enroll in any of the available courses by clicking the green online button. Um, where it says to be scheduled, that indicates when a particular course is scheduled to be offered, but enrollment just hasn't opened up yet for that quarter. And then as you can see, we don't offer every course every quarter. So you will wanna kind of take a look at the schedule and map it out accordingly. This slide um, contains information about the articulation agreement that we have in place with the University of San Diego to provide you a next step in your uh, educational pathway. After completion of our e-learning instructional design certificate program with a letter grade of B or better in each course, USD has agreed to accept our coursework as six units towards their fully online masters in learning design and technology. So if you're interested in learning more, I've included a link on this slide but we're also lucky enough to have Christy from USD joining us today to share more details. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Christy who will also be helping moderate today's panel discussion. 
Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're so excited to share about this partnership. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, USD and UCI teams work together to identify this opportunity um, in which students can apply uh, their UCI credits towards our LDT program. Um, so as mentioned, with a grade of B or better in each course um, from the certificate, you may be eligible to receive credit for our uh, LDT 500A and our LDT 500B uh, in the MS LDT program. Uh, so those are our, those are our first two uh, foundational courses uh, that we offer in the program. So uh, you know whether you are currently working on the cert, if you've completed it, um, come our way, come learn about us. Um, to if you were to start that process of transferring those units, uh, you would get in touch with your um, program coordinator. Uh, let us know. Let our advisor know that you've completed the certificate. Um, we get those transcripts uh, uploaded to uh, the university to complete that process. So uh, a really great way to continue your education um, if you are already on the path um, with UCI here. Um, a little bit more about our program in general, uh, you can see at a glance on the left some important dates coming up. Our next application deadline is on August 1st. Uh, the term for that class starts on September 6th. So uh, all in our program is 20 months, um, a little bit shorter for those who are taking advantage of this transfer credit opportunity because you will uh, be able to waive those first uh, six units. Uh, the cost per unit is 710. Uh, total program cost is um, just over $20,000. And again, that would be adjusted for those of you who are already coming in with credits. Uh, but in general, we have 14-week uh, terms. Uh, you take two seven-week classes, um, but uh, you take them one at a time. So one seven-week class and then your next seven-week class. Uh, the program is 100% online. Um, and on the right, you'll see uh, what you'll learn. So in addition to the two uh, courses that would be waived with this articulation agreement, these are the rest of the courses uh, that you'll see. And you can learn more about these uh, on our website um, and dive a little bit deeper. But uh, learning media design, assets and artifacts, educational research methods, uh, so many great topics. And of course, it uh, culminates in our capstone course. Um, so if you want to learn more, I will go ahead and drop uh, our link in the chat so you can uh, take a look at our website um, and get connected with an enrollment advisor if you're not already. Uh, and if you do decide to apply, uh, we're happy to offer uh, a waived application fee um, for that application. So just let your advisor know uh, that you are here today and you would love to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. All right, and then I'm thrilled to uh, introduce both of our speakers today. Um, as mentioned, we have Christy Tucker, uh, Learning Experience Design Consultant with Cinead Learning, and Valerie Kazada, uh, Instructional System Designer at Takeda Pharmaceutical. Uh, both of these speakers come to us with uh, 20 years of experience and knowledge. Uh, we're so glad to have uh, us with them. I'll let you all uh, here go ahead and, and read a little bit more about them on the page, but I want to open it right up to Christy and Val to say hello uh, so we can go ahead and get to the meat of this session. So welcome, Christy and Val. Thank you. It's awesome being here. We're so yeah. glad to have you. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started um, with some questions. So please feel free to drop uh, additional questions in the chat. These are some of the discussion topics that we will be going through, but we do, of course, uh, we, we value your questions and your input. So please let us know what you would like to learn more about. Um, but to get started, we will uh, get into, how did you get into instructional design? Uh, and I'll have Val, if you could start with that question. Sure, sure. Uh, so like most people, it's not a straight journey, right, guys? Um, I actually originally was hoping to go to vet school and did not get into vet school and ended up in the biotechnology industry, pharmaceutical. And along the whole time I was doing that process, I always became the trader. No matter where I was in the different places I worked, I, I always ended up being the trainer and helping to create curriculum. And finally, I gave into it. So for most of the years, I've been a technical trainer on the floor teaching the processes for manufacturing and or the testing methods. And finally, one day I woke up and went, OK, I, 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 I need more. This, this isn't enough anymore. And I started searching and found the instructional design program. And 
looked into it and I actually uh, did my master's program at Cal State Fullerton. And after that happened, my job actually created the position for me, which I know is not a normal way of a normal process. But I got lucky and I that is what I'm doing full time now. Great, thank you, Val. Christy, would you like to uh, jump in? Sure. So my career has always been about learning in one way or another. I started as a K-12 music and band teacher. So those of you out who are there who are teachers trying to think about you know, getting to this field, yes, it can be done. Um, and uh, I actually did a couple, two years of corporate software training. Um, first, I did the, the stand-up training um, route for a while, uh, teaching software, and then got a job initially with an online university doing instructional design. And that was in 2004. At the time, the there was a lot less of online higher education and fully online programs in 2004 than there is now. And so that was kind of a new thing. And it was, um, but it was, it was really exciting. And I learned a lot there. My career has bounced back and forth since then between higher education or, or at least somewhat higher education and corporate. I'm, I think I'm fairly unusual in having worked in both and, and still to some extent to do, do a bit of both because I do sometimes support um, associations working in higher education. So there's, so I still have my foot in the door a little bit in higher ed. Most of my work nowadays is workplace training. I've been working for myself since 2011 and started my company. And so I've been working as a consultant for over 10 years. Great, thank you, Christy. And Christy, what does your, I'll go to the next question. What does your typical day or week look like? So I think, typical. <laughs> yeah, as I say, so, so it's hard to do a typical day. I do like a, a typical week is I think a more realistic frame because the reality, one of the things I love about the field is that there is so much variety and I can really be doing very different things um, at any given time. Um, for me, a, a, a typical week, I, you know, on a typical day, I do start out with some amount of email and checking LinkedIn. I moderate two LinkedIn groups. Um, and so I always kind of, you know, do some of those things in the mornings with that social media. Generally, I have one block of one solid block of work in the morning where it is some amount of storyboarding or writing or planning. At the moment, I'm doing a lot of project management for um, one of my clients. And so some of, some of it's actually more, more project management, catching up with the people who are on that team. In the after, I try to do more of my client calls in the afternoons, and so I tend to schedule those calls. And so I, I all of my work with all of my clients is remote. I hardly ever meet my clients in person, and so we meet via Zoom. Um, I have Slack discussions with some of. I have Slack channels to have ongoing discussions with a couple of my ongoing clients. And so we use that, we use other tools for, you know, file sharing and everything. So my work tends to be, I do spend a fair amount of time usually creating courses. So that is doing designing, planning, outlining, or writing and storyboarding, scripting things, or building in storyline or beyond, or twine is another tool that I use for branching scenarios. And so, it's a, a combination of those things. Um, what, it, what the actual mix is does depend a lot on the clients and the projects that I have. Um, so yeah, like I said, at the moment, a lot of project management and I'm doing some LMS work and, and website WordPress redesign things, which is not probably typical overall, um, but those, those sorts of projects are also coming up. Great. Thank you, Christy. Val, what about you? Typical day or week? Well, I do not have a typical week. Um, I can give you a basic understanding of maybe what this week and last week and next week will kind of look like, but it bounces based on what my company needs are, 
And since I help the entire business, I jump around, maybe one project is for EHS, one project is for an agile group, one project's for manufacturing or the labs. Um, right now, my calendar is filled with one of my favorite projects I'm working on is content for AR, for augmented reality. I'm using the Microsoft HoloLenses and developing out a pilot project for the site to take a look at before we go further with it. Uh, another project is scenario using Scenario VR. I'm working on two projects for two different groups using that one. Um, so a lot of development time I have blocked out to help me with that because otherwise I can't focus. I'm stopped every five seconds because I do come in to work. Um, I'm hybrid. And so if they see me, I could end up um, pulled away for many reasons. Some other projects I'm super excited about that are, I'm, it's not my project per se, but I'm a, a SME is the metaverse. Our company decided to jump on that bandwagon. And so they're designing a metaverse for our, the company and they're using a group of us to help in workshops design that. And I'm doing some e-learnings. There's some old school e-learnings that I am working on to uh, for different business units. And for that one, I do use Articulate, uh, Storyline, and Rise. I do have access to Captivate and Lectora, but I, I tend to stick with Articulate. I just feel more comfortable with it. Um, but there's nothing wrong with the other software. And I do use uh, Simple Show to create the whiteboard animes. I know that um, Christy had mentioned that, and I think there might be some questions about some of the tools. So I won't get deep into that question. Um, but yeah, it can be all over the place. And what I think I'm gonna do on a particular day can change dependent on the business needs. Since I do work for business, I'm not working for myself. Great, thank you, Val. Um, and Christy, it looks like we got a question for you. What is your go-to tool for file sharing and managing projects you're working on? Great questions. Um, so with my clients, because I work with multiple different companies at a time, so I, I generally at any given time, I have at least two clients that I'm working with, sometimes three. I try not to have five. Uh, but you know, it happens. Um, so I, I, I do default to whatever my client uses. The quick answer is whatever my client uses is what I'm going to use. Um, since some of my clients are brand new to this and have never done any of this before, um, primarily Google Drive is the is my default. Um, but I, I also do have Dropbox because I have clients who prefer Dropbox. Um, I have used Teams and SharePoint um, with clients who use those. Um, so for file sharing, however, Every client gets uh, one Google Drive, one folder in Google Drive, and then they get, and then I have subfolders within that. In terms of managing projects, um, and I think the project management piece, I think we'll, we'll ask Val about that too. I think there are different ways depending on what kind of project you're doing. If for, I'm doing a lot of Trello these days and doing Kanban boards for, with at least a to do, doing, done, and at least that much of a board and some of the things that are a little looser projects, that's actually kind of how we're project managing it. Um, for more traditional e-learning things where we've got to, we know what the scope is, we know what the steps will be, and we've got a deadline that we've got to go to, I do actually like old school Gantt charts. And so um, I've often used a, a paid plug on, plugin to Google Sheets that creates a Gantt chart so I can do project management, sort of like Microsoft Project Lite. Um, I'm looking at Airtable right now. Um, Airtable has the ability to look at both. You know, you can do a Kanban and you can do more Gantt chart and traditional things and have schedules where if the if one thing changes in the schedule, that it adjusts all of the deadlines of everything through. So I think that that's a thing. So Val, what do you do for project management? Because you, you're clearly juggling multiple projects at a time too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we are very heavy into Microsoft Office 365 applications. So I obviously take advantage of that primarily. Um, I have OneNote that keeps track of each project individually. So it will have my overall notes for meetings because I can bring them in from each meeting and add to them or send them back out. 
And then I also use something like Trello, uh, but they call it Planner in Microsoft Teams. And basically it connects to my Outlook. And so I can bring in my to-do cards that way instead of having to start fresh every time. And I categorize similar to what Christy is talking about, what I need to do today, next week, or what needs to be put on pause, because I do projects do go on pause sometimes for whatever reason. Um, I used to be better about setting up a Gantt chart for every project. And then I spent more time with it than actually doing the projects because things were changing all the time. So I, I've kind of given up on that for now, for that kind of stuff. But overall, um, yeah, I'd say mainly using OneNote. Um, I use OneDrive too to store all the projects and I tend to back up everything um, twice, especially my storyline files. I will back up most of the other type of things like my simple show and scenario VR are backed up on the cloud. Um, so I don't worry about those as much. And um, yeah, I mean, that's my basic organization. Great, thank you both for sharing. Um, got a couple of other questions in the chat I'll read. Um, one is asking about uh, what are the various career types um, and perhaps average annual income in the industry? Uh, Christy, do you wanna start with that one? Um, yeah, so, so I think there's a kind of at the broad strokes of things, there is the higher ed, the more traditional university instructional designer, that the job of instructional design in higher ed is often one of coaching faculty and guiding faculty to design better courses, and especially to use the technology and to do things online. Um, and especially as things have in higher education have shifted a lot to online, the instruction designers were the people who made the emergency remote teaching possible in universities when the pandemic hit. Higher ed tends to be lower paying overall, although the benefits can be good. Um, then there is the workplace training, which tends to be higher pay, although it varies widely between industries um, and titles are all over the map. Um, so you can look for things and what gets labeled as instructional designer as a title can sometimes mean just somebody who does storyline development and is really just doing development and sometimes mean somebody who does everything including stand-up training. And, and you could do the whole gamut of things. So you, Go less by job titles and more by what's in the job description and, and what they're talking about, what they're asking for. Um, I think that the you know, there are a couple of sources out there for, for salaries. The Learning Guild has done salary surveys and has published things. And I you know, recommend getting a free membership to the Learning Guild so you can get access to their report. So you can actually drill down. They've done in their past things of, you know, by location or by region of the country, or if you're in a metropolitan area or not, um, or by different regions, how much the salaries are. And so I, I recommend, because there's so many factors that affect it. I do recommend looking at that. ATD has some salary um, survey and, and histories. Um, higher ed jobs also has done some, you can get some salary information on the instructional designers from them. Um, the, the other option is government work, which tends not to require a portfolio, but does have other specific requirements. Um, they will always lay out very clearly in the job description of like exactly what they need. Um, and you're on a salary schedule. So you can be a 1750 instructional designer. And so there's, there's ways to go get into the, the government instruction design um, if you have the right background and especially those tend to be in, um, you know, if you're in Herndon, Virginia, you're going to have lots of choices for that. Um, if you're around DC or if you're in areas where that those those jobs exist, that can be very good. And the pay actually can be very, um, very solid with great benefits for some of those government jobs. 
So, Valerie, do you happen to know the sort of starting salary numbers off the top of your head? I'm drawing a blank. No, it is all over are. the place. I mean, I'm yeah. in the pharma industry and they tend to pay higher than some of the other industries. So I think it depends a lot on, yeah, like you said, Christy, don't just look at the titles, look at the descriptions of what they want you to do and the requirements. Um, like my title, when I first got it, I was like, what, what is that? I don't. I don't understand it. And I, I kind of ignored it at this point because I'm all over the place. I do e-learning, but then I create videos. Um, so I don't necessarily look at my title even anymore. Um, and it's harder to explain. I, I And I, I've seen some questions there too, asking about learning experience designer, or instructional designer. In my mind, it's all the same. It's just each company, each industry kind of picks their name and goes with it. Great, thank you both. Um, let's see, one other one in the chat. Uh, are there any skills gained, uh, this one's for you, Christy. Are there any skills gained during your time as a teacher that helped you venture into learning design? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of, certainly one of the, the things that I liked about teaching was the curriculum planning piece of it, right? Where I was looking at, okay, we've got state standards and I know where I need them to be nine months from now. So if I know that they need to be there nine months from now and this is the goal, then if it's halfway through the year, then they're gonna have to get to this point. And then if that's where it is at the end of first semester, then where do they need to be first quarter? And from there, I can break it down nine, you know, for I've got nine weeks to get them to that point. How am I gonna break it down? There's a lot of project management, frankly, that I did in curriculum planning and a lot of, thinking about how to structure and how to build skills over time. I also think because I was a, a music teacher and a band teacher, in music and band, you do a lot of actually doing the thing, not just talking about the thing. Uh, workplace training and e-learning solve for a lot from we're going to tell you about things and then ask you three multiple choice questions and never give you any opportunity to practice it. Um, never give you any opportunity to make decisions. And one of my goals always in creating workplace training is to give people the opportunities to practice those skills. It doesn't always work out. I'm not going to promise that, you know, not, not everything is this like a great ideal project where you get to do all the things. Sometimes it is compliance training where literally the goal is to reduce the company's liability. And that's really the only thing that we're caring about. Um, I, I don't want to pretend that that isn't part of the job too, but I think having, having had that perspective as a music teacher where I was used to practicing things was all useful. Um, everything that I had learned about writing tests, I'm frankly much better at writing multiple choice questions and writing assessments now than I was as a teacher. Um, it was all good. What I, what I learned in ed psych in college was good, um, but I, I I think I actually, I know more of that now. Um, I think right, knowing how to write learning objectives, knowing how to break things down, knowing how to assess whether people learn things or not is good. Um, it isn't, teaching does not, there's definitely transferable skills. It is not a one-to-one -one thing. If you have 10 years of experience as a teacher, you do not have 10 years of experience doing instructional design. And so, um, it's not, it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one transfer, but it is relevant. Um, so there are some of those skills. You can look through, ATD has a, a competency model where you can look at what competencies instructional designers should have. And so you can look through that, or you can look through, you know, the UCI and USD courses and sort of look through, well, what are the skills that are being taught there? Which are the pieces that I already know? or at least kind of know from teaching and figure out where your gaps are. So you can sort of look at it that way of seeing, okay, I know these things, but I'm gonna to need to learn this software and I need to learn this needs analysis piece because that's the needs analysis and workplace training is different from, I have to match the state standards and the you know state and national curriculum standards is not the same as needs analysis. 
Great, thank you, Christy. Um, one of the questions in the chat ties really well into this next question on, on this slide. So I'm just asking about um, some projects that clients have asked you um, to work on. Uh, and Val, I'll start with you, but for a little bit of that in the next question, which is what types of projects are your favorite and why? Whether they're client um, requested or, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So my favorite projects right now uh, relate to the virtual and augmented reality. I'm super geeky in this tech stuff and I love learning how to use it. And so I, I have probably been spending more time on those projects than anything else when I get a chance. Uh, the other projects I didn't mention yet, I have been uh, doing lots of videos lately, not just learning videos, but other types of videos for the business. And so I have gotten very comfortable with some of the Adobe uh, apps, particularly Premiere Pro. And Premiere Pro scared me to death because I was actually doing most of my stuff in Camtasia before that. So jumping over to Pr Premiere Pro was a huge jump, but oh my gosh, I don't think I'd ever go back. Uh, it is an amazing tool and everything that I can see my progress when I look, go back and look at videos from two years ago to now. And I'm like, wow, it does make a huge difference. Learning these applications, you become very valued, valuable asset for them. And so it, it's nice to have in the, in the corner to use when I need to. Uh, but my favorite stuff right now is the, is the virtual reality, augmented reality, metaverse stuff. Um, super geeked out on it right now. That's great. Christy, what about you? I think, so my, the projects that are the most fun for me to work on are branching scenarios. And branching scenarios, if you haven't seen these before, think choose your own adventure except for training, where it is uh, practice making decisions in some sort of environment where there, it is built through a story um, I have one of the companies that I work through does interactive videos. And so we do these interactive video scenarios. So I write the scripts, which then are done with, they hire actors and they set it up and they have a professional video crew and a makeup artist and the lighting people and all the cool things. Um, and, you know, you have a little video snippet and then you have to make a decision and whatever you choose then you get to see a different video based on what choice you make. Those are super cool fun projects to work on. Um, even the ones that are not the video version of that, there are much simpler, um, less, less flashy versions of those branching scenarios that I do quite a bit as well, um, more, more text-based or built-in storyline. Um, those are lots of fun for me. Um, and, and I will also say I, I really like the anything where it is, um, where I do get an opportunity to learn something new, right? That's, that's part of the fun of being in this field is that there is always something new to learn. I was, uh, I spent last week at the Learning Solutions Conference in Orlando, and I had a call with one of my clients yesterday who, who and I was talking about attending sessions and she said, well, gee, you know, you have, you have a lot of experience in this field. Are you still going to sessions and getting things out of it? Yes. Yes, I am. I like learning. I am completely a nerd about learning. That is why I am in this field. Like, yes, I go to all, I go to sessions and every time when I'm not presenting something, I go to other sessions and see what other people are doing. And um, some of that can be tools like Beyond as the animated video tool has been a really fun tool to just play with. Like it's, it's neat. Um, Twine for making branching scenarios has lots and Twine is used for interactive fiction and a lot of game design. And so there's independent game design. So there's there's a lot that can be done with it. And I know I'm sort of just barely scratching the surface and what that is. I also like doing the projects where I've just got interesting SMEs to work with. And I learn about, uh, you know, I, I do, because with consulting in particular, I get a big wide range of topics. I've done baby behavior and bulldozer safety and doing you know safety training right now and I'm also doing library association and storytelling and uh, trauma-informed services and um, let's see stormwater protection for a municipal government 
and uh, how to influence people. That was an interesting course. Uh, you know, like there's there's all sorts of stuff. Um, so it's 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 a lot of of different things, and and I like the variety. Part of my one of my favorite things is the variety. That's great. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, there's so much there and so much experience that you have. And so I'm wondering, Christy, what is your advice, whether you do have a lot of, of, of variety to show or maybe you don't when it comes to um, building a portfolio and what kind of advice you have um, for folks who are starting that process? So I think for a portfolio, first of all, don't feel like you are only allowed to show projects from work. I think people get hung up on the idea that it has to be only real projects. Yes, sometimes you can do it with real projects and that's a great thing. And many of us can't share things or you can only share little bits of things. Um, so if you can share things, you know, certainly ask, you know, can I share this? Can I share a portion of this if I take out certain portions of this? Um, you know, yes, it's worthwhile to ask if you can share things, but many people find themselves in the position of having to create some samples for their portfolio. So if that's the case, think about what types of jobs you want. Think about, you know, sort of that ideal client of, or company of like, if you could work for any company, what would that company be? And think about what kind of solution they would have, what kind of problems they would have, how you could solve that. Do short samples. Do not build a full 30 minute course. Training, hiring managers aren't gonna go through a whole 30 minute course. Do something short. Um, do something interactive, especially if you're trying to show that you are a developer or if you are the person who loves the technology, show that off in your portfolio and then have some description with it for how you did your, you know, what, who was the audience? Why did you do it this way? Why did you, why did you use this tool? What was your role in this? You know, something about, even if it's an imaginary thing of the, I did this for a, you know, fictional HR, consulting firm that, you know, needed to have, you know, a sexual harassment training that would do more than the usual stuff, right? Whatever the, whatever the problem is and talking about that. This is probably also the point to plug the uh, portfolio course in the UCI program, which I do co-teach. I'll do my little plug before we pass it up to Val to talk about portfolios. <laughs> Yeah, um, I actually, I have trouble with portfolio because everything I do is proprietary, but what I have done on my website, I, I've, I've created a website, I actually went out and um, thought about going out on my own and I got my DBA and all that and it's kind of been on hold, but I do actually have a website that's live with some of the portfolio, basically it's more imagery with explanation. Um, because of the proprietary nature of it, but I, I do have something out there. So when I do ready, when I'm ready to step off that cliff, there's something for me to kind of catch me as I'm figuring it out. Um, so yeah, Christy's your go-to for the portfolio. <laughs> but Val, if you were hiring somebody, wouldn't you rather have images of, of a couple of screenshots, but an explanation so you can tell that they actually know what they're talking about? Yeah, then sure full interactive things, but no context. Yeah, yeah, true, true. And they explain their thought, their process, you know, how they how they created it. And so then I understand how much tech they really understand too. So mm -hmm. yeah, I agree, true. Yep. Great, thank you both. Val, I'll keep it with you for the uh, next question on the next slide. Um, if you could talk a little bit about um, what do you, uh, maybe dislike about the profession? What is not your your favorite part about it? <laughs> Things for people to be aware of when they're getting into oh, it. Oh my gosh. I think the biggest, one of the biggest problems I have uh, with my, the population I work with is they want everything in whatever it is. Just everything needs to be there. In, in, in e-learning, in VR, whatever I'm creating, they cannot, everything. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. So I usually create buckets for them. Uh, three buckets, the have to has or the must, right? They have to have this because for whatever it is, it's a, um, it's a compliance issue or it's safety, whatever it might be. And then the things that would be nice to have and then those things you really don't need. And I have them bucket everything for me. Um, 
before I dive in. So usually it's a compromise going back and forth because I understand that they need some of the stuff because if, if, you know, for EHS, for example, there's compliance issues and they literally have to have it there. So that's one of the things. Another thing that usually happens and don't let people tell you it doesn't is a uh, project creep. They say they wanted this and that is it. There, that is it. And then all of a sudden you, sh you start showing them iteratively what you're doing. Oh, you know what? Can we do this too? Oh, can we add that? Can we? Oh, okay. Um, we need to actually end this project at some point. I need to deliver something. So I have to be very good people skills, right? And maybe in the next iteration, you know, let's try and get this out there based on our original scope. Uh, so having to deal with people can kind of be a problem sometimes. Uh, so being that, that's probably my biggest my biggest hiccups right now. I think like like Val, I think some of the compliance training things um, can be, um, you know, I, I have some of these um, the the uh, environmental health and safety things. I, I've got I've got a client right now where it's a lot of safety training. Um, and, and yes, indeed, it, it literally is. The purpose of the training is to reduce the company's liability. If anybody learns anything as a secondary goal, like it's bonus if anybody learns anything from the training, um, which can be kind of discouraging. Um, and so there, there is definitely some of that. There is, um, and, and you know, sometimes you can still work with that and say, okay, well, you know, California requires that everybody has a one hour sexual harassment training every year. And if they're a manager, they've got to have two hours and it has to be two hours and we cannot get around that legal requirement. Um, so you can look at ways to maybe make it less painful, you know, to have it be not as boring. Um, but sometimes it is pretty boring. There can be times that it is, um, there, there certainly can be times that you are also, as much as I like learning lots of new things, some of the content can be, I've done some really heavy regulatory content. I've also done healthcare content where it is lots of searching on PubMed and going through some pretty dense um, medical content, um, which can be hard. Um, I also, the, the scope creep is some of it. It's also the annoyance of, we have 12 reviewers on this project and I'm still supposed to meet a schedule. You have 12 reviewers. So can you make, can we have one person be the final decider? Because we've got 12 people and they don't agree on what needs to change. That's what always happens. If you have more reviewers, the timeline for the project is automatically going to expand. As you see Val smiling and nodding, right? This is, this is the thing. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that that's the scope creep is definitely out there. Um, it, it can also be hard of, you know, you do have to get to an end of a project. For my very first instruction design job, I remember asking the two, um, the two IDs who I was going to be working with on the team, what the hardest part of the job was. And one of them said, knowing when to let go of a course, that it's good enough that you can just put it out there. And 20 years later, that answer has still stuck with me because you know what, I still struggle with that of, I've never in 20 plus years made a perfect course. Every single course I have ever made, I could go back to now and make the writing a little tighter or make something flow better or have a better assessment question or have a more interactive practice activity that better reflected the actual skill or use better multimedia, use better visual design. Um, all of those things, it, it, is, it is constantly this battle for what is good enough. Um, and for me, of course, you know, good enough is enough that the client is happy with it. Um, but but that can be, you know, there's, there's that whole side of, of managing the business and managing the people. Because I think it's, is, as Val said, it's, it is a lot of managing people um, as much as this is behind the scenes work rather than on stage like teaching was or training. Um, 
there's still a lot of managing people and managing subject matter experts and um, managing stakeholders. Great, thank you both. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, we're gonna move on to the next question. Um, and I'll start uh, with Val on this one, if you don't mind. What trends do you see affecting instructional design? So my biggest thing is the tech, right? The tech is changing leaps and bounds. Uh, I, I mean, I still go to the old school stuff. I'm still using e learnings. I'm still creating um, instructor-led trainings along the way and videos. But I really see the AR, VR, metaverse stuff taking off, um, hopefully using in the right way. I know I, I saw a question for Gail. I tried to answer quickly because I know our time limitations, but it needs to be used for the right reasons, right? Some material obviously wouldn't work well in those situations. So trying to explain that to your stakeholder who wants that VR so badly, um, it's your, it's my, my um my education my knowing how what should be the best tool based on the what they're trying to do so but ultimately i think i think we're going to see more things out there like that i didn't mention i'm also working on a um, chat bot project so you know I, I really think the tech is huge and getting to learn that tech as an instructional designer is huge um I, it's something i during the first few semesters of my of the program I, I was in, I realized I was really interested in, and I seek it out all the time. So when I go to a conference, I usually end up in those types of talks or those vendors. Um, and I'm also following a lot of that stuff on social media, on LinkedIn or Twitter. So I, I think that that will be very instrumental to an instructional designer going forward being able to take in that tech and know how to use it best. Thanks, Val. Christy, um, anything to add? Yeah, I will say, so one of the big trends that I see in the field of instruction design, and we sort of alluded to it before, is that the job title doesn't necessarily tell you what the, what the work is. I think that there's a lot of fracturing within the field. There's a lot of sort of mini specializations um, because you can go, there's just too much. Nobody can do all of it, um, regardless of what job descriptions might might actually imply of like you know doing everything. So instructional designers are both generalists because you have to you do have to know a little bit of everything. You do have to know some technology. Um, it's really hard to get a job if you don't know any tools at all. Um, but you also have to be a little bit of a generalist because you're going to be in part of a team or you're going to be working with like subject matter experts and stakeholders in a lot of different departments. And you have to be able to talk to all of these people who are experts in other fields. You are the expert in learning, but you have to talk to all of them. So you're that generalist. And then there are sort of the, your specialists. Um, Cami Bean in, the, in her book, The Accidental Instructional Designer, talks about it as sort of T-shaped skills where you have one bar across as, a, as your generalist and then one deep expertise. I think that that's not quite right anymore. I think it's more, you have a little bit of one thing and you have a lot in, in something else. And then, you know, I have a lot in writing and I have a lot in scenario-based learning and I have a medium length one in storyline and I have, you know, some of these other things. So I think that all of that is, um, I think there are lots of different ways you can go in the focus of your career um, and still be with under, Instruction design is just this huge umbrella um, under which there are a lot of possibilities. And if you are um, a person interested in the tech, I mean, I do, I, I agree with everything Val said, right? Chatbots, um, chatbots are, are out there right now. AR right now. VR, I would say VR and Metaverse are probably a few more years away from getting more widespread. Um, but even that, the development tools and the templates that are available for people to build in VR and to do metaverse things, um, all of a sudden I see a big acceleration in that too. Um, so I think that those things are there. Great, thank you both. Uh, we're going to um, go through two more questions before we end in our last five minutes here. Um, so Val, I'll start with you, uh, some of your favorite software applications. Oh yeah, favorite. I already mentioned um, Scenario VR, which is owned by eLearning Brothers. It's a great non-coding uh, software that you can use to create 
it's not VR in the sense that you're in a world that's kind of more cartoonish. It's using 360 images or video, um, but you, you can use them in the headset. So you can immerse yourself in the in either a tour or training, which is the way I've been using the, the software, but super easy to use. I don't need any coding background, for example. Um, some other software I tend, I, I know that Christy mentioned she uses uh, Beyond. I use my Simple Show because that's what we use in house. Same idea though, it creates these whiteboard animes. I've used Potoon before um, and I liked using it too. Um, for e-learning, I have already mentioned that I, Articulate is my go-to usually. Uh, although the other two, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just the one I'm most comfortable with at this point. Um, I love the Adobe Creative Cloud. So if you have that ability to get the Creative Cloud, oh my gosh, it's amazing. All the applications you can learn there. I haven't even touched probably a majority of them. Um, trying to think of any other ones that are just really jumping out at me right now. Those are probably the hot ones that I'm, oh, Microsoft HoloLens is like I said, I told you before, I'm working on a project with them. Um, very interesting. It's, it's, it's my, my thought on that, if anyone's in the same world as me and they use SOPs, what I'm trying to do is replace the Microsoft HoloLens tech with reading an SOP. So you can immerse yourself in it instead of sitting there, read and understand, which no one ever does. So yeah, those are some of the big ones. Uh, Storyline is the tool that I use the most for e-learning. I use do Rise for some things. Um, and I, I mentioned a tool called Twine, which is specific to the branching scenarios. I will put a link in chat to there's an event um, this week with TLDC. It's free to their members or $10. Um, even if you're not going to attend, though, go look through the list. It is a tool summit of two days of everybody's just going to geek out about tools for two days. Um, I'm so... I'm going to present on doing chat pots and twine um, and but look through the list and see what people are what tools people are talking about, even if you're not going to attend. That's great. Thank you so much. That also that uh, ties in perfectly to our last question, um, which Val, I think you had an event you were going to mention, but um, any conferences associations that um, you all recommend getting involved in. Um, yeah, so I, I'm a little bit biased. I'm actually a, a director at ATD LA. Um, I'm the volunteer director. So if you do happen to be part of the, that, is that particular chapter, please reach out to me if you want to volunteer. Um, but the organization's great. There's actually local chapters and a global chapter, which actually has a conference coming up next month that I'll be attending. I'm not speaking. I just get to attend for fun and enjoy the conference. So definitely a good one. There is a ton of other resources out there. I actually have a list. I'll share it um, with this team after what I've created a little list um, that maybe they can put together the, of, of things that are free or very minimal. And so, of course, the ones that I gear to me are there's a VRAR one that I'm a part of. There's instructional design ones that I enjoy. There's so much of it that you can only do so much, right? I can only be on conference conferences, webinars so much of the day. I actually have to get work done too. Um, but when I can, I, I at least um, register because they usually will send a recording. So I can always go back and look at it later. Uh, so definitely um, those are some of the, the top things that I recommend. Um, I'll I'll do the the plug for the TLDC that I posted the link to because they they do have a lot of free events too. They sort of alternate between free events and, and member paid, and it's I think seventy five dollars for the year, so it's not horrendously expensive. The Learning Girl Guild has a free membership level, and you should at least do that. Um, ATD Velma mentioned look into your local chapter wherever you are, whether it, even if you're not in the the you know the LA chapter or whatever that is that is nearby. Lots of local chapters are active in those. Um, often have good events and, and sometimes have events even if you're not a member yet so you can check it out. Um, there are um, Training Mag Network does a lot of free webinars and you can check out that. Um, there's another group which is GLDC, not to be confused with TLDC, which is I think Global Learning and Development Community. They've been putting on some things. The Learning and Development Accelerator, LDA, also puts together um, some free events. 
some of the, again, some of theirs are free and some of them are members. So you can watch, however, for the free things. Learning Guild does some free things as well. So there is, there's a ton of, of free stuff out there. Great. And so you can, you can sort of see some of that. Perfect. Thank you both so much. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to uh, pull you back in here to to close this out. I know we have some um, outstanding questions and Lisa will uh, let you know how we will uh, get those answered. But thank you, uh, Christy and Val, so much. Thank, thank you, you. Yeah, Val and Christy. Thank you so much for sharing about your pathway into the industry, giving us your suggestions and recommendations, um, answering a lot, a ton of the uh, questions that are coming in through the chat. So thank you all also for all the live attendees for submitting those. We've, we had a great dialogue going on over there as well. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to send them my way. I can uh, forward them on to Val or Christy or Christy from USD as well if you have any questions about um, the program over at USD. Uh, so feel free. I know that some, we weren't able to get to every single question. So if you have a question, feel free to forward, forward it, send it to me and I'll forward it on uh, depending on the subject of the question. Um, thank you all so much again for joining us. If you have any questions, um, here is my contact information. Um, if you saw any summer 2022 courses that piqued your interest, again, enrollment is currently open for the summer quarter. And then if you have any questions about USD's Master's in Learning Design and Technology, um, please feel free to connect with Christy as well. Uh, thank you again to our panelists and thank you all of you for taking time out of your day for joining us. Thank you, it was great. Thank you everyone for being always more fun with an active uh, with an active audience and active chat. Definitely. Absolutely. Thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.